Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. Well, today we're talking about mind flares, or the illithid, the remarkable beings that are psionic, they're tyrants, they're interdimensional slavers, they're copyrighted and belong to only one play set out there, and that's of course to Dungeons and Dragons, and yet they fascinate us, they absolutely absorb our attentions, and is it because of the weird tentacly thing? I'm not entirely sure. Sure, but it's not a theme that's unique to Dungeons and Dragons. Science fiction have been using weird tentacled monsters for quite some time. And uh, there's a reason for it. Their weird alien-like look just... Well, there's something scary and insidious about it, and they make for a slightly less traditional enemy. Now, uh, there has been a few images that have been brought through. I mean, like the one behind me, absolutely spectacular. Uh, truly, truly love it. And uh, then, of course, there's this one, which is almost like a corporate logo for Mind Flares, isn't it? And that's something that's interesting, because we're going to come to that a little bit later on in the video, where we talk about the collective Mind Flare space. And then, of course, there's this one. I just absolutely love the drool coming out of the corner of the mouth. Anyway, thank you. I didn't ask for images for, for Mind Flares, but people took the initiative anyway. And, of course, you can find links to their various websites down below in the uh, description if you want to go and check out more of their artwork or support them. So let's look at these illithid, the Mind Flare, uh, the illithid uh, creature. Now, if you read the description in the latest uh, Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, they are vi very, very, very different from the traditional creatures that you would link in the same kind of category. You might think of these as vampires or as liches, which of course we've done on the channel before. They are not. They are a very different space. And the reason for it is because I call the Mind Flayer, I call them a gateway creature. They are a adventure campaign launch creature. A vampire, as we can see in Curse of Strahd, of course, is definitely an adventure on their own. But the Mind Flare, to me, is more of a lead to an adventure rather than necessarily being the whole adventure. And there's a few reasons for it, but I'll get into those in a little bit of detail later on. So let's go back and look at the physical characteristics of the Mind Flare. Obviously, they've got tentacles. The book describes them as interdimensional slavers, and they uh, build up or had at one point a giant uh, empire, which they controlled by using their mind-controlling powers. They dominated the Gith Yankee and the Gith Zarai, as well as various other races. And this empire was massive, 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 massive. And then it collapsed collapsed, breaking the mind flares up into smaller hive minds, these individuals that form part of a collective mind, if you like, and they can talk and communicate with each other over five miles, which is a significant radius if you think about it. The book also continues to talk about the fact that single or solo mind flares would be outcasts or have been literally expelled from hive collectives that they would have been part of originally. So, to me, immediately, that sets them apart from the Lich and the Vampire, who are, by their nature, isolationist. Now, of course, we have the werewolves who've got their pack, but a pack is very different from a hive mind, which the book very clearly talks to. This collective telepathy which allows them to talk to one another, to share and exchange thoughts and ideals over such a vast distance changes the type of creature they are. However, if you read further into this creature, you discover that they are also incredibly cowardly. They're not physically nearly as terrifying as a vampire or a werewolf or a dragon for that matter. They are fairly weak. They're very, very intelligent, but they're not very strong. And a level 2 fighter with a couple good hits could take them down fairly easily. So, what makes the Mind Flayer so terrifying? Why do we see it as this monster that gets voted for by people like yourself? 
Well, I think it's because of the fact that they consume the brains of their victims and in doing so absorb their victims' mental memories, their, some of their powers to a limited degree. They basically are stealing away the very essence that makes a character a character. Now, this is something that we as GMs need to capitalize on and to use if you are to make the Mind Flayer as terrifying as it could potentially be. Now, Mind Flayers obviously also take thralls and they dominate those around them that they can use as they choose. The book actually says they'll have these thralls commit suicide basically by throwing themselves in the path of the adventurers rather than the Mind Flayer physically confronting an adventurer. They, they would avoid combat if they can. So again, that's something that's very different to the other monsters that we've looked at so far. The other monsters don't shy away from combat because they're very strong and good at it. In this case, the Mind Flayer does. So then how do we then go about it? And how do we make this monster that much more interesting? So I spoke about being it being a gateway monster. Now, what makes it a gateway monster? Well, quite frankly, because of those two factors. One, it's interdimensional, and two, there's this hive mind. It allows us to establish this, this entry into an interdimensional war. Now, traditionally, when we think interdimensions, we think science fiction. We think um, planes are really what it's all about. And fantasy and interdimensional interplan are really, they are six of one and half a dozen of the other. I know they are different, but the idea is the same. It's not just about the prime material plane. So the characters could, having tracked down this mind flayer whom they thought was a rogue element, step into an interdimensional portal and start on this epic campaign where they have to work with the Gith Zarai or with the Gith Yankee against mind flayers, where the mind flayers have sent bounty hunters out to try and stop the players' characters who are causing all sorts of nonsense in the interdimensional war that's going on. So it really leads you to this fantastical space where you can bring a certain sci-fi-esque nature to the whole thing. And I think that's what makes Mind Flayers so interesting, is that they give us the capacity to step outside of the normal realm. And I think if you don't utilize them for some kind of interdimensional shenanigans, there's that word, I think you're going to be in trouble. So it is something to bear in mind, is that they allow you to step out into this interdimensional war, this interdimensional space anyway. And if you're clever enough and you've got the players to have found an artifact that allows them to skip between dimensions, but maybe not necessarily choose the one they want to go to, you start to open up this Pandora's box of adventuring life that really takes the players out of the space they might have thought they were going to be in and puts them into this remarkable space where you can play with all of the different dimensions, such as time and... Uh, space etc 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 so you can go mad and, and and really enjoy that the alternative which these creatures are a gateway to is battling this hive mind so instead of having an individual which is the big bad you have individuals who are manipulating the story from all different angles as this collective hive mind and that i can almost imagine this giant ancient illithid that sits at the very center as the big brain kind of connecting everything together so it creates a much more interesting network a much more interesting organization if you like to try and break into from the player's perspective because they're all connected but at the same time they 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 have minions which you have to worry about and of course the minions allow you to use almost anything that you like werewolves obviously generally hunt in packs so werewolves will use werewolves and that's what you can expect vampires have their wolves and bats and of course the vampire themselves dragons of course are dragons so as as of yet we haven't really had an, a monster that can utilize so many different aspects now imagine if the player is busy talking to an npc and suddenly the npc's eyes go blank and the mind flayer has taken control of them and is going to use them to do something i think that's a particularly exciting space to be in for the gm for you obviously and for your players because they just don't know what to expect so those are the two spaces that i think could work really really well now another reason why i call these guys a gateway creature or monster anyway, is because if you've set up your NPCs as support and guide and mentor NPCs and your players have really invested in these NPCs and have taken them to heart, 
the Mind Flayer has that wonderful ability to absorb memories. So when the NPC gets abducted by the Mind Flayer's minions and the Mind Flayer rips out their brain and absorbs their memories, the Mind Flayer becomes this wonderfully insidious opponent who knows what that NPC knew and who can quote back lines and memories that that NPC had when facing the PCs. Now, why do I take such joy and pleasure in this? Because it sets up a beautifully clear line of antagonism. The mind flare goads the PCs with memories and thoughts of the kindly NPC that they all loved and adored, but who was taken away. It gives the villain just so much evil it makes the villain so dastardly that the players want to get revenge on this individual and of course you can then open it out to the rest of the of the game so the idea that the illithid can use the memories of the npcs that the players have interacted with is fantastic you can really really go to town with that and that i think is a lot of fun uh, yes you have the seducing monsters like the succubi and that sort of thing who can read minds and telepaths and things but the fact that the mind flare had to consume the brain of the individual that murder in itself and then uses it against the players for me just really gets me really gets me excited to explore this very 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 evil creature so we're looking at coercion and we're looking at telepathy now something else that has come to my attention and i did not know this before i did the video i went and read up as much as i could on mind flares is that they have their own form of writing qualith i think it's pronounced which is a kind of tentacle braille they can run their tentacles over this stuff and read it i think that's absolutely wonderful now how does that translate into the game well comprehend languages spell and theory will allow you to read it although it's not necessarily a written language and it's not spoken either it's articulated so uh, it's an interesting one and one that you'd have to decide upon in your own campaign but it certainly gives them this amazing flavor imagine if the chair they sit in has got all of these bumps and they read it and the bump says strap left arm here strap right arm there strap around neck to get to brains uh, it's a wonderful 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 hidden message which could be as part of a dining room set that the thrall of the mind flare is forced to use a kind of in-house joke that the mind flare has the people sitting down in their own chairs of execution voluntarily as a matter of fact so that is something that allows you to to really relish this mind flare who's sitting there working out how to avoid combat but how to get the most brains out of the party if you like now of course the question happens and comes up what happens if a character's brain is consumed by a mind flare and there's the mechanics on how to do that in the monsters manual what happens if the brains of a player character gets consumed and then the player character is resurrected or brought back to life through various magical powers well the mind flare obviously is not going to lose all of those memories as a matter of fact it creates a much more interesting situation where the mind flare is almost the pc's mirror and has access to all those kind of wonderful things and we've seen those kinds of spaces being created in films all the time and that makes for a very interesting role playing so again the mind flare just gives you these really really cool options to explore slightly more cerebral and this is an intended uh, analogy of course slightly more cerebral adventures that are going to get your players to be really wearing their hats tightly uh, to make sure that something doesn't happen now just lastly on the mind flare is that because of this weird alien-esque type of thing with their tentacles and all that kind of wonderful stuff the way that you portray them i feel needs to be slightly different as well so this can be some physical theater where you talk with your hands in front of your mouth whenever you represent the illithid it might be funny for you or maybe not as serious as you like i would tend to try and make them think differently in a slightly different way as well so they can speak slightly differently uh, perhaps it's more with this idea of a hissing sound because of all the tentacles mm, i don't know it's really up to you to try and interpret how to make the 
sound different. Uh, I think another option would be to have them speak as a collective. We don't want your money. We want your brains. Something like that, perhaps. Perhaps it's about using different words or the wrong kind of words because they don't know them. Or perhaps it's about them shifting through various accents as they basically go through the different brains that they've consumed in the past. They have all the memories of these things that they've eaten. So it's about maybe having them split. Suddenly they speak with an effeminate voice. Suddenly it's a deeper voice as their brains kind of process whatever it is that's going on. Now, of course, the final thing that I need to say on the mind flare is that they have tentacles. Use them. Those tentacles are freaky. There's no doubt about it. Have them lick the players or sucker across the players. Have it open their mouths. Have it go up their noses and their ears. Wherever you feel you can go with your party. Have those tentacles go there. And I think that's something that you can really play up is the sliminess, the mucus that's on top of them. And even the book even talks about a mind flare after eating, having a sheen of mucus over itself as it excretes this slimy stuff because it's so ecstatic that it has consumed brains. This really is a creature you can play up the psychology, you can play up the ick factor, the ickiness factor. I'd almost rather have an undead lich who's leathery, papery and dusty than this slime covered tentacled invader who's going to try and take over your mind. In my case it would be a very poor feast indeed. Anyway, I hope this has given you some insight into the mind flares and into the idea of how to use them in such a way that pushes them beyond just being a giant monster. I always had it in my mind that mind flares were these tall creatures. They are tall, but they're these tall creatures that simply are violently difficult to kill. I seem to remember them being a little bit more tough in 2nd edition, but uh, as they've evolved and as we look into 5th edition, we find this much more interesting creature, which brings a very different take to uh, the idea of uh, monsters as opponents. Hit that like button if uh, you like this video. Hit the subscribe button if you want to see more. For those of you who are artists, I think the next video in the monster series anywhere that we're going to be looking at um, is going to be and I'm going to change it up a little bit from the voting. It's going to be Beholders. Now, they didn't come up very often, but they certainly came up enough to warrant them on the list. And uh, they're quite different from any of the other monsters that we've looked at. So those multiple-eyed Beholder creatures, those are up next when we look at them in a couple of weeks' time. Until next time, again, thank you to the artists who submitted their work. And uh, remember to go and check out those links below in the uh, description box. And until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest gaming.